Hello, everyone, and welcome to our discussion with the scientist regarding work within the Mai Project. My name is Dalton Dietrich, and I'm the scientific director of the Mai Project Cure Paralysis. Today, we have the opportunity to talk to Dr. James Guest, who's a professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery and a very important component of the Mai Project mission. Uh, Jim, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Fantastic. Now, uh, Jim is um, a, a very unusual in that he's a, um, a clinician scientist. In fact, he's a neurosurgeon. So what he brings to the My Project mission is the ability to translate our preclinical and translational work into the clinic. So that's a very important component of what the My Project obviously is trying to do. So today, I think we'd like to talk about uh, Jim's views on um, novel therapeutic tr clinical trials targeting spinal cord injury. It's actually a pretty interesting time now, isn't it, Jim? It is. All right. So one of the things that has uh, happened uh, in the last few years is we've realized that doing sort of the usual model, which is the double-blind randomized controlled trial, is extremely difficult. Uh, the recruitment rates have fallen. And so uh, in order to just be able to complete clinical trials, we really need to think about how to make them more efficient and how to get to an answer uh, regarding the therapeutic more quickly. And so uh, there have been a number of uh, helpful advances. Uh, one of the most important uh, is the use of different statistical methods than we used in the past. So in the past, we would use pretty typical methods like an ANOVA or a T-test. Now, when people are planning trials, they use mixed models. And mixed models have advantages in terms of getting more information uh, at earlier time points uh, in, the, in the study. And so another way to talk about how studies are changing is to talk about adaptive methods. Adaptive methods um, got established in oncology. And so, um, Often an adaptive method is sort of combined uh, with a biomarker, again, to allow you to make choices about your clinical trial earlier. And those can be applied to uh, the dose group, to escalating uh, the enrollment to subjects that have more to gain, but also a little bit more risk. And also you can do something called an interim analysis which allows you to make a decision about your clinical trial uh, earlier, and therefore you ascertain whether it looks good or whether it, uh, the evidence seems very weak. So and those are some important. Yeah, those, those are very important components because many times um, these, these patients, these subjects are volunteering uh, for these right. clinical trials, and they're spending a lot of time on their own to be involved. So you'd like to be a little bit more efficient in terms of doing this long, big study, and at the end, finding out basically that maybe the therapy uh, did not work and failed. Right. Yeah, so, and there's also the cost, you know, factor to be, to be considered as well. Yeah. So yeah, so we're shifting towards uh, more efficient clinical trial methods. And of course, as you mentioned, uh, which you just uh, talked about, we don't really have that many, especially in the acute clinical setting in terms of um, human spinal cord injury in the United States. It's a epidemic throughout the world, but in the United States, you know, about 14,000 people each year having uh, a severe spinal cord injury that could be yes. actually recruited into a, a neuroprotective study, for example. Right, yes. Okay, so uh, getting back to that point about um, uh, limited uh, patients, especially in the acute injury setting, uh, one of the strategies that you're involved in is being part of a network in terms of groups throughout the United States and Canada as well, coming together to recruit patients to actually ask a, a, a clinical question in terms of a therapy. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Sure. Yeah, so data is power, right? And so in spinal cord injury is very heterogeneous, happens across a wide spectrum of people. There's variation in the level and severity. There's also variation in the sort of comorbidities and, and other events uh, that occur. And so because of that, having um, 
a large n value on which to sort of either mine the data or specifically search the data is really valuable. And we benefit from the foresight of some people who realized this some time ago. And so important networks are the model system, which was established in the United States and is the largest uh, data set. We also have the one that I've been most involved with, which is the North American Clinical Trials Network. It was established in about 2007. Um, and we have over 1,000 subjects enrolled to our registry. And we can therefore look back and, and to sort of interrogate the data. In Europe, the uh, European multi-center study about spinal cord injury has enrolled uh, more than 4,000 subjects and is also a really valuable data source. In Canada, we have RISCR. So a lot of data sets have been established and now uh, the data can be made available to um, well-qualified uh, biostatisticians to learn things that we would not even necessarily have thought about a priori by interrogating the data. Very good. Yeah, I, I think the networks in terms of other types of neurological problems are, are following this uh, strategy in terms of getting together so um, power in terms of large data sets, in terms of uh, data, uh, data mining, for example, right now, and using the new state-of-the-art computational uh, neuroscience to actually get a really complicated question. So it's a really exciting time, as we said, in spinal cord injury. So what are you most about excited about in terms of the therapeutic interventions that we can use in patients today? What are you excited about in terms of what's happening uh, in, in the Miami Project and other places throughout the world? Well, the most exciting thing that I've ever witnessed is what can happen with neuromodulation in a person who appears to be absolutely neurologically complete. And so I first uh, had the chance to see this about a decade ago when an individual that I actually examined, and I would agree they were neurologically complete by our standards, um, had an epidural stimulator turned on uh, next to their spinal cord. When that was done, the person had the ability then to move their ankle, their toe, and their leg voluntarily. I would never have thought that would happen. And so what it's done is it's taught us that our interpretation of spinal cord injury and post-injury capabilities has been uh, a little incomplete. Mm -hmm. And so the spinal cord itself has a lot more autonomous uh, capabilities than we ever imagined. Yes, we, we have a lot to learn, don't we, about we do. spinal cord injury and how it works. And, and of course, how it relates to uh, the brain and things of this nature, the whole neuro axis and the autonomic nervous system. I mean, we have to not just deal with motor function, but we talked to, with other faculty about uh, neuropathic pain and things like that. And uh, of course, um, now we're thinking that maybe we can utilize circuits that are still there to actually retrieve function. So it is very exciting. Now, another um, uh, part, uh, component of the Mind Project that you've been really intimately involved in is novel therapeutic interventions using cell therapies. So are you still excited about cell therapies? And what do you think the future of that particular uh, 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 direction for repairing the nervous system is? Right. I mean, there's nothing like a cell, right? It's a, it's a living autonomous entity that can integrate into the injured tissue it can provide extracellular matrix, trophic factors, axons can grow around it. And I think, you know, in the beginning, we were maybe just a little naive about how quickly, you know, we would realize the benefits of cell therapy. But there's no question that, you know, cells, particularly uh, neural stem cells, but other cell types can repair and replace in the nervous system. And so we need to sort of keep at it uh, and not uh, give up too early or we won't reap the benefits of this powerful strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think combining different strategies is the future as well? We talked about neuromodulation, uh, cell therapies, and of course, a lot of that, when you come to the first floor of the Lois Pope Life Center, you see people doing a lot of rehabilitation. 
So maybe the combination of all these factors um, can, uh, can actually uh, enhance recovery even better than one, one factor alone. That's completely true. So, you know, thinking back, you know, when we thought about diseases like diabetes, well, we saw insulin as the solution. But spinal cord injury is much, much more complex than that. It affects essentially every tissue and organ system in the body. So there's no question that we will need to combine several strategies in order to get the best effect out of any given strategy. Okay. I think you would be in a great position to talk about this next. Um, um, again, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, not really knowing when the patient is injured how that patient is going to do in terms of natural recovery mechanisms. And, and if we knew that, for example, maybe we'd be more aggressive or triage patients that, you know, if they go through, you know, routine rehabilitation, they could get significant improvement. But someone else that looks like they have the same neurological symptoms acutely, or even the MRI imaging looks very similar, that particular individual actually needs um, some type of more experimental therapy. So where we are with that discussion in the, in the clinical fields? Yeah, I think the word we commonly apply to that is sort of stratification. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we can understand more about the prospect of an individual <clears throat> to improve. So a really important technique that uh, has been introduced is called recursive partitioning. And so recursive partitioning means that we define uh, cohorts for recovery from large data sets like we were talking about before. And so even though an individual looks relatively similar to another individual, small differences uh, in their motor scores, their sensory scores um, can strongly predict uh, how they're likely to do. And so recursive partitioning methods are being applied now to clinical trial enrollment. Another thing that is of personal interest to me is the use of neurophysiology to try and understand what connections are still present in the nervous system. And so we're able to understand these connections even when we can't see movement in the person. We're able to see that the connections are still there. And if they're still there, it makes sense to invest uh, heavily uh, in that person in terms of rehabilitation and other therapeutics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really uh, interested in you know, your last lecture you gave and, and talking about utilizing electrophysiological strategies to look at recovery of function or some of the indicator of function uh, and looking at the, um, the intercostal musculature, for example, in, in terms of breathing, which is an extremely important component. So uh, as we continue on, there's a lot of tools we have in our toolbox to actually assess you know, how well the subject's doing in, 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 in that regard. Um, therapeutic window. I mean, this is discussed a lot in, in clinical medicine. In the acute injury setting, how, how soon do you have to give some therapy to limit secondary injury mechanisms to, um, to protect tissue from dying and enhance recovery? Or even in the chronic situation, you know, when to initiate rehabilitation, when to initiate cell therapies and these types of things. So let's talk a little bit about therapeutic windows and what you think about as a clinician in trying to treat patients living with spinal cord injury. Right, well, I, for me, there's kind of two windows. There's, there is an acute neuroprotective window and then there's everything else. And so the acute one, as, as you know better than most people in the world, uh, it has to do with processes that are initiated almost instantaneously or in a few hours after the injury. And if they run their course, things like neuroinflammation and disturbed uh, cell metabolism will make the injury much worse than it was, you know, when it first occurred. And so, you know, there are therapeutics that can attenuate uh, these processes, and um, they do need to be introduced relatively early. And so from a clinical perspective for acute neuroprotection, you know, what we've learned is that earlier is better, but we also have to look at the pragmatics of what is, what's, what can, what's possible. And so a number of clinical trials have instructed us that uh, 
to be able to get a neuroprotective therapy on board within three to six hours is challenging, um, possible in some settings, not possible in others. And so a very um, commonly selected therapeutic window is 12 hours. And so current uh, interventional studies are testing whether 12 to 24 hours uh, is early enough to dial down some of these destructive processes. So true, because um, many in the, the very early neuroprotective strategies, they were starting the therapy just because the patient didn't come into the emergency room until 24 hours later. And right. going back into the uh, data set, realized that maybe they had missed that therapeutic window. So that's a, that's a big problem still in terms of acute therapeutic interventions. Uh, and the therapeutic hypothermia trials that we're doing, we're always struggling with, you know, are we giving the therapy um, too late to actually uh, target that secondary injury wave? So uh, there's a lot of things to do. And, the, and of course, now maybe utilizing biomarkers such as um, blood levels of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines might give us, uh, or imaging may give us a, um, a window to even do therapeutic interventions earlier than maybe later. And again, that's gonna probably vary, I think you'll agree, from patient to patient. Uh, one patient has a different type of injury. The cascades right. are a little bit different. And, and so um, we have a lot of work to do in the, the clinical translation of our work. But, uh, but thank you, Jim, very much for spending a little bit of time today with us. We really appreciate your contributions to um, the uh, spinal cord field as a whole and, of course, the Mighty Project. So thank you very much. And we'll get you back here uh, to actually update us on some of your work in the future. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.